I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Small is Not Always Beautiful, Moving to Enterprise Applications to the Cloud. I'm Jeffrey Sika. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat and a Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we would like to welcome our presenters, Paul Jenkins, uh, Product Manager at Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, uh, Cloud Native Services, and Tony uh, Vertenten, Co-Founder and CTO of Intris. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a QA box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to uh, drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such, it is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful uh, to everyone, all of the participants, presenters, and peers. Uh, please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Paul and Tony to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, for joining. Um, we'll get uh, right into things and um, just introduce myself, as uh, Jeff said, uh, my name is Paul Jenkins. Uh, I'm a product manager in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, working um, on a developer um, services part of the organization. Um, and that is, I look after kind of customer contact, customer outreach for our managed Kubernetes service and our API gateway products. I've been in Oracle a uh, little over uh, eight years um, in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure as a product manager for the last uh, four and a half years. Before that, I spent an awful long time um, at IBM. And uh, yeah, I've been in the industry um, probably for longer than most of the audience have been uh, on this planet. Um, in the current state, I, I'm working from home, so I, I am <laughs> I'm hoping that um, nothing is going to go wrong. Uh, I've switched my uh, landline off, so um, hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll be good to go. And I'll hand over to Tony to introduce himself. Good uh, morning or afternoon. Um, my name is Tony Vertenten. I'm a co-founder and not CEO, but CTO, too much credit there of interest. Um, we uh, founded the company 25 years ago. So uh, I think I'm a bit longer in the field than Paul, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we've been a Oracle customer and we, well, Paul asked me to talk about our journey from uh, on-premise to the cloud to Kubernetes. And I'm glad to do so. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'll, I'll get going. Um, so, so firstly, we've got a bit of a quiz. Um, not I expect um, anybody to answer, but I was just wondering how many people would recognize this um, and knew what it is. Well, it's in fact probably um, the original um, CD tooling that I worked with back in the day. Um, Back in the day when I first started programming, then um, this was a uh, coding sheet was how um, we created the program code that got sent off to a, an agency where um, the code was transferred into punch cards. Those punch cards were then loaded into this hopper and they were uploaded um, into a, a machine that was almost exactly the same is that one um, and then we were able to start um, compiling and running programs and we were, we were at the height of tech then when we had three of these for a team of 10 programmers that was the uh, pretty cool and then what was really cool is when we each had one on our own desk and that we were really productive then so that's kind of where, where I started. And I think it's safe to say that things have moved on a little bit since then. So what, what's, what's really happened is that 
is that um, the way that the process of development, uh, the way applications are uh, designed, the way they're deployed um, and what they run on has changed quite a lot from um, back in um, certainly the early 80s when, um, when I was doing that wonderful coding. And that kind of evolved um, through the agile processes, uh, the multi-tier um, deployment, starting to use virtual servers. And instead of everybody having their own data center, we started to see the, the, the rise of hosted um, systems and outsourced uh, systems. Today, we're kind of looking at an evolution of that, which is more the, the DevOps uh, process of uh, design and development using microservices and service-driven um, architectures to deploy uh, the actual application logic. We're starting to see um, people wanting to, to use containers and serverless to, to be their deployment and packaging because it's much more efficient and more transportable. And people, uh, organizations are looking to uh, use the cloud and not actually have to worry about owning or, or even running um, infrastructure. So while we've come kind of um, a long way from the top left-hand corner in the, uh, in the 80s down to the bottom right-hand corner uh, of, of today, um, the basic, what we're trying to do is still trying to deliver um, business value to our organizations. The fact that we're using different techniques and technologies is kind of, doesn't change the whole, whole lot really because we're still trying to, trying to do the same thing. And all that's really happened is that instead of punch cards and, um, and card readers and um, coding sheets, then we're using more modern um, IDEs and source control and CICD um, tooling to make it faster and easier for us to deliver um, the change and the, the business value uh, of the modern application development process and using the cloud as the environment in, in which to run. Now, um, over the years, um, I've seen lots of organizations um, and wanting to, to make this um, transition. And there's always a big desire for, for this to, um, to make a really big change. You know, I think we've all seen um, the Dilbert cartoon strip, uh, which the answer to everything is Kubernetes. Um, people aren't quite that deaf, but these are absolute questions that, you know, when we've been given, um, asked to go in and talk to a customer, we say, okay, tell me how, we, I want to go completely serverless. How do we do DevOps? We we've, get that question so often. Um, what about serve microservices? How can we do, reduce our delivery time? These are all kind of big desires, but it, it's kind of symptomatic of organizations wanting to make that, that move into the cloud, uh, which many are kind of still struggling with uh, from, from the enterprise space. And I think there's some, some real fundamental um, issues and art questions that need to be asked, which aren't uh, these, these big questions. There's, there's some practicalities about dealing with the, the reality of what that actually means. Because the realities of an enterprise of, doesn't have to be particularly um, large but moving to the cloud is dealing with some fundamental um, questions and issues around complexity of, of existing systems. There's a lot of technical debt in, uh, in enterprise systems and it's the diversity and the complexity of the entire stack of having lots of different hardware that's being used through different programming languages, ways of integrating and accessing between systems. That's not such uh, an easy thing to, um, 
to address and it needs to need some some thinking about how we're going to address that diversity and the complexity of the stack required to move an application from um, on premises in, into the cloud. Um, pace layering, not all systems need constant change. So what I'm referring to here is there was a few years ago, um, Gartner came out with this concept of pace layered applications um, and saying that um, applications change at different speeds depending on where they sit in the sort of business chain. So the concept is that at, at the, the bottom is you've got systems of record. Uh, these are the systems that you just have to have in order to be running a business, to be legal, or to be compliant, and just to, to function. Uh, above that, there's a layer of uh, what they call systems of differentiation. And these are systems and processes that you do as an organization that differentiates you from competition. So it may be the way that you handle customer complaints, the way you onboard new customers, it, it, those kind of unique value um, value adds that, that you as an organization produce. And then the, the top layer is the systems of innovation. So these are fast changing sort of digital environment that uh, you're trying new things, it might work, it may not, it doesn't matter, the whole sort of start quick, fail fast, all that all that kind of speed and agility to um, much more customer um, digital um, experience kind of things. And the sort of things that I'm talking about when we talk about not all systems need constant change. I was not long ago, I was speaking to uh, a CTO of an insurance company and he was saying that, um, you know, they, they've got this sort of digital platform, digital transformation going on there, creating uh, mobile applications and um, starting to look at um, de deploying microservices, but they need, they still need um, to make their delivery cycle a lot shorter. So they're like on a four week cycle, they're really trying to um, get down to a three week uh, change cycle. And he was complaining that you know the real problem is is that I cannot change all my systems quick enough that the the policy management system was um, uh, an application system that was um, bought in from commercial supplier, and they can't change it um, quick enough to get into their their three week cycle. But when we actually talked a little bit more about um, whether that system, why would that system need, need to change so much? And after we'd had a talk and he thought about it a bit, he said, well, the reality is that every time we do, uh, um, do make a change to that system, it takes months to roll out that changes and educate all the users on the new features and functions of that. So, well, actually, I don't want it to change. And that kind of bit of an epiphany moment for him. Um, and that's when it comes to those sorts of systems, what you really want to do in, in order to get the, va the value of, of moving everything to the cloud is to be able to lift and shift that application uh, environment from an on-premise environment to, to the cloud. You don't necessarily need to change it. Um, to get the value added moving to the cloud. The other um, reality is, is skills. Um, organizations that have um, you know, enterprise Java applications and, and enterprise um, Java servers have got a certain skill set that is very much focused around the development of those applications, not necessarily much around the operation. Of those of those systems, so there's a there's a, a gap um, in what the organisation has and can do, and what it needs to be able to do if they're making that that transition. And I think one some of the biggest problems um, of doing that is around organisation culture, uh, not something that um, is really going to be solvable um, by moving an application to the, to the cloud. But one of the, uh, a great example of the sorts of things 
that um, are, need to change with it beyond just technology. In our um, engineering center um, in, in the UK, we, we get customers come in and uh, talk to, want to talk to us about how we do things um, in terms of development for the cloud and our processes and all that kind of stuff. And we had a public sector, it was a police force, actually came in and wanted to talk about the whole DevOps approach and uh, how we transformed as an organization to, to, um, to do that. And when we talked about skills, um, he, they were saying that part of their problem is that they have Java programmers in their organization that are great Java programmers, but all they want to do is be Java programmers. They don't want to start looking at um, you know, the operational side and working in different team structures, etc. And the other thing that um, struck them was we, when I took them uh, just on a quick tour through the office, we happened to um, get a, um, there was one of the teams that was working on um, uh, our functions at the time were having a big um, huddle around trying to address a problem that, you know, there was half a dozen sat around a desk and looking at the screens and, and discussion. And they said, oh, this is entirely different from our organization. Our developers are all sat down in their cubicles and it's all silent and, you know, they're just working on what they do and chuck it over the wall. Those are sorts of things that beyond technology that really um, we see is probably bigger stumbling blocks to, to moving uh, to the cloud. So when we do um, speak to customers and go and uh, see what's going on, there's kind of a, a, a journey that seems to be um, becoming a, a, a pattern and a, and a model for, for this, that people take their existing applications and think, well, now we can start, um, see if we can run them in containers and Docker being um, a very popular one uh, in the commercial enterprise space. And then start realizing that, well, if we've got the more of these things that we, that we have, the, the more that we need to, be able to manage them, and then we start looking at um, at Kubernetes as the um, as the endpoint, and which is great. But um, when we talk about the skill set differentiated different differences that we mentioned just now, then they need they need help in moving these enter Java enterprise applications into um, into Kubernetes. So what we, um, what we have is, what we see is that the trends uh, are moving to cloud naturally. Uh, embracing Kubernetes is a preferred deployment platform for um, enterprise Java applications is something that we see and something that we're helping customers with and um, something that we um, are supporting and working to try and simplify the deployment of those applications onto um, Kubernetes. Why is that? Because A, they can, they can migrate their existing applications, then we've got an environment which customers can then use um, as a path to get to microservices, to things like Helidon, um, Istio, et cetera, to be able to do that and start to then have an environment that maybe they can start to migrate their applications. So to that end, um, what, what we've done is that we've um, released uh, a Kubernetes operator for WebLogic that basically helps our customers be able to lift and migrate their, their enterprise applications um, to the cloud. Now what that, um, what that means is that it enables these organizations to make use of their existing skills. So me as an enterprise Java developer don't necessarily have to throw that out the window and start to learn something new from day one. It allows us to focus on um, creating and managing the applications that we're used to uh, rather than having to worry 
everything about um, running and operating a Kubernetes cluster. So that also the operator then uh, understands the application server cluster, it, it understands about domains, it understands how to scale uh, the cluster. Um, and what it also does is it makes use of um, Kubernetes to, to automate the life cycle of the operations of that uh, application server. And it also um, allows people to start to transition into um, modern tool chains like that, that we looked at, you know, to Jenkins or whatever um, CICD tooling, we, we can start to deploy it as containers and have that um, much more automated way of um, deployment of, of, of application changes and, up, and updates. So what we've done um, is fully open source is we've released the WebLogic Kubernetes um, operator that basically manages the lifecycle operations from a Kubernetes point of view that understands starting, stopping um, an application server environment to automate the configuration um, of that environment and supports standard um, Kubernetes, things like sidecards, um, custom resources, all that sort of thing. So it can, it, it can really understand and um, both the Kubernetes side of things and operate uh, web logic. Uh, as I say, it's, it's open sourced and um, fully supported on, on GitHub. So what I'd like to do now is to um, hand over to Tony uh, and Tony will um, just talk us through his, their experience of, of following this, this path uh, and some of the um, challenges and some of the, uh, the benefits that they, they found um, during, their, um, during their journey. So um, I'll hand it over to you, Tony. Thank you, Paul. So um, we are Idris uh, and we are an independent software vendor. Uh, and we have created a Java EE application for the logistics service providers. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's forwarding companies, shipping agents, warehouse, that kind of stuff. Um, we have uh, a little over 300 customers. And the interesting part there is that they range from two users uh, to the largest one who has a little over 450 users. So it's a challenge as far as deployment is concerned. We are also um, having an embedded software license with Oracle. And this is important to know why, because that means that we have to actually install all the Oracle products separately for each customer. So we cannot uh, actually use a, a, a real SaaS model, if you like. We also uh, are using Agile Scrum for development and we have a, a new release every six weeks. It used to be four weeks, but I'll come to that problem later on. Um, we are not the biggest company. Uh, we have, as a development team, we have uh, 12 uh, application developers uh, and we have another team of four that do mainly integrations. And by integrations, I mean setting up uh, EDI, enterprise service bus stuff, that kind of thing. Because in logistics, um, there is a lot of uh, application integration going on between suppliers official instances and so on. I've tried to, uh, it's maybe a bit small, but I've tried to uh, put out the, the way with um, the application is set up on the web logic. And that means that we have actually two domains. One is the application domain that has, uh, as always, an admin server needed. And we have four separate managed servers. Those managed servers are used for what we call Fries Master. That's mainly for the interactive to the UI part. Uh, we have a, a Tris service that has all the services that are provided by the application. And then we have a Tris uh, enterprise service bus that is based on uh, Apache Camel um, that is used to for, uh, mainly for the integration between the different parts. And of course, we also need a managed server for the broker. Uh, other than that, we use uh, Oracle Business Intelligence to uh, 
provide a reporting and analytics, but also a very important part of it is we use it to generate and create documents, as there are still a lot of different documents used in the logistics world. Uh, and then all this is connected to an Oracle Enterprise uh, database, which uh, has the application data, of course, but also used for the meta data service. Uh, and then we have some uh, other open source tools used like open office uh, mail server stuff like that that's running on a separate server so that's um, the application and a small introduction and now i'll demonstrate my voice controlled slides next slide please paul wait so what are uh, the challenges we uh, ran and run into, uh, first of all, is um, we focus, as Paul mentioned just earlier, more on application development and really less on deployment and operating and all the, and all the stuff involved. Now, one of the things uh, we ran into uh, frequently is that there is a mix of environments to deploy our application on. It's usually the customer that decides what kind of infrastructure he has uh, we do give him like the minimum requirements we need they don't not always follow our uh, advice on that uh, and there's a they can be both on premise and in the cloud uh, when we started out it was mostly on premise all uh, exclusively on premise it's only in the last uh, two three years that we actually see our customers being interested in moving to the cloud before that, in logistics, everybody wanted his own service, his data, his security. That's luckily uh, that has um, changed a lot. The other thing we noticed is that the performance is varies extremely uh, on the different environments. Even though we have the same uh, Oracle stack, we have the same application, same database, we still noticed that with some customers we have very good uh, performance and with other customers actually very bad performance well we always discussion and a lot of work and finding out what exactly was the cause of that bad performance and mostly it was the case with setting up the system itself like, um, the well-known error please do not use a virus scan on your database for it deployment was also a problem in the sense that we did have uh, scripts to uh, as much, as much as possible automate the deployment but because of the variance on those uh, different infrastructures those could not always be used as a solution uh, we uh, we uh, set up a standard cloud environment so we had uh, we could offer our customers a standard environment in oracle cloud that already changed a lot in the sense that it was a uniform environment. So the Linux was the same. We had the same uh, CPU, same memory, same uh, disk uh, storage. Uh, so, uh, and that gave us exactly what we wanted, namely a good predictable performance. The other thing is that we were able to actually standardize all the deployments now. So that was already, uh, a lift of a big burden on our deployment team, which by the way, is only about four people. So we, we, not that, uh, we, we didn't have a big team there. Um, we used uh, one compute instance for small, small customers. So we have everything running, all those managed servers and the different two domains on one uh, uh, compute instance. For the larger customers, we use three compute instances. Next slide, please. Okay, that already gave us an answer to a lot of uh, anger and, and, and worries about uh, having a performance issue. But now we're faced uh, with something else. And that is, as I said, we have a new release every six weeks. But it, it took us eight weeks to have all the customers, uh, to have the new release deployed to all the customers. And that is something that we really set out to do is that we really want all our customers to have the same release. Now, the solution there was, um, after having uh, seen some demonstrations, was going over to Kubernetes. 
the obvious advantages there is uh, one is I could automate my deployment and actually connect that to my CI CD pipeline. Um, that means that uh, once the new release is available, we could actually automate the installation at all the different customers, be it those customers that had uh, agreed to use our cloud environment and some of the customers that also agreed to have Kubernetes on their on-prem. But unfortunately, not everybody has made that move yet. The other big benefit I found is the blue and green scenario that should be deployment. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is, it gives me the opportunity to actually uh, already prepare uh, the new release. And uh, once we have the, by matter of speech, press the button to release it, it will actually start and see what pods, what Kubernetes pods, are uh, eligible to start replacing. And then it will fire up the new release in the in different pods. So that means that there is no longer a downtime required at the customer side, which is a great benefit because part of the problem why it took eight weeks to install every customer was that not all customers, well, as I said, none of the customers wanted the downtime outside of the office hours. So we were always limited to weekends and nights. It's uh, also a big benefit for my deployment. The other, uh, sorry, one thing I need to mention by blue and green uh, deployment is uh, one of the uh, problems there you have to solve is uh, your database schema. Because in well, almost every case, when we have a new release, we also have a, a different database schema. Uh, fortunately, there we could make use of the Oracle feature called edition-based redefinition. That meant that we could practically use the same uh, my, the same way of working uh, in the sense that we could already prepare a different schema in the database and by uh, putting in an, a, um, another parameter in our connect we could make the, we could have the new release actually make use of the new schema. What's also a benefit is a better use of the resources. Um, when we offer the cloud environment as I mentioned before uh, the smallest unit we could offer our customer is uh, one compute instance. Now, for those customers who only have two users, that is a bit of an overkill. So, um, by using uh, the Kubernetes, we were able to share those compute resources and offer our uh, smaller customers a better solution. As also, I think Paul already mentioned, it also was the, the fact that um, it is scalable. So that means uh, that if we see that some of the managed servers have a bigger workload than expected, we can easily scale up the, the number of managed servers, for instance, for the three services. Um, and the nice thing about this is that it can also be automated. So you can actually go and measure the amount of memory or a CPU a certain pot is using. Or uh, the managed server in this case is using. And if you see that it's 100%, uh, which sometimes happens when big uh, EDI jobs are running, uh, you can actually scale up and add another pod for that. As also mentioned, is the other big benefit is that it is available as well in the cloud as on premise. So that means that we can further uniform uh, make the standardize our way that we deploy our application. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a simplified schema of how we set up the, um, the application or the deployment in the different clusters. So we have uh, three nodes uh, in three different availability domains on Oracle Cloud. So this also gives me uh, added benefit. And we agreed with uh, Oracle that um, if we put every customer in a separate namespace, that they would uh, see this as a separate installation. So we would not breach our embedded software license. Um, and we can 
kind of modify or uh, adjust that to our customers' needs. So uh, the example above is a, a medium customer which has uh, two instances of the master in the service, but the massive broker in the enterprise service bus, as well as the SE1, OBI, sorry, is um, just running in, in one pot. Uh, then we have the off solution for the smaller customers that actually only have one instance of the Chris master in the service. And of course, we still have the OBI uh, for the document. And then we, at the bottom, I uh, have an example of what we would do with the bigger customers. Although there we um, choose to put those in a separate cluster as not to overload uh, all the rest of the customers. But that means that we can actually um, use uh, this solution for the smaller customers instead of just one on an instance I can put like we haven't tested it yet how far we can go but it seems that we can easily do 10 customers on a three node um, solution. The other thing you see is that uh, each customer has its own PDB so that's uh, it's a private database uh, it's a feature of Oracle uh, and that is running on uh, a database cloud service as is, uh, was advised uh, by Oracle, among others, but also in literature, it's not always a good thing to put your database in a Docker container. You best put that outside in a different service. Next slide, please. Okay, so going over to Kubernetes is a big help, uh, but uh, it's not an easy walk. Because, uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, we well, we didn't have any knowledge on Docker on Kubernetes, and it's, it is a, a big challenge. There is a, a lot of stuff available. There is a lot of decisions to make on on how to do things. You can uh, you can have your solution set up in a different uh, way. Uh, so, where do we start? Well. Um, as also mentioned, we didn't have any experience with ops. We focused really on application development. Um, and the other problem is that, of course, uh, setting up that environment is you also want to monitor and manage it. You want to be able to act on problems. Uh, and if, uh, if by prefer uh, preferably pro be proactive, so act before a problem occurs. The solution we find there was that uh, making use of existing tools, because if there's one thing I learned about uh, the, let's say the general philosophy of a Kubernetes is that um, it is uh, one of the directions is make it as simple as possible. So the existing tools we use is, as uh, mentioned by, by Paul, is the WebLogic Kubernetes operator, which really does a bunch of things that Otherwise, we should have created uh, services, uh, pods, deployments, uh, jobs, uh, daemon sets, all those things um, we don't need to do. It's the operator that takes care of that. Uh, also, uh, scaling and changes is, is taken care of by the operator. Um, we also use two other open source tools from uh, Oracle. One is called the WebLogic Deployment Tool. What that does is actually it helps us to create um, the, uh, the WebLogic domains. Uh, not only created, but there is also some very nice features like actually discovering how a web logic uh, is set up and actually creating uh, your models so you will be able to create uh, new domains based on an existing one. Uh, also, the, the possibility to update your uh, domain uh, afterwards. The other web, uh, open source tool we are using is uh, the web logic image tool. As the name already says, that one is uh, actually creating uh, your Docker images uh, for you based on um, uh, making use of the WebLogic deployment tool uh, itself. So what it actually does is it uh, loads all the uh, necessary software from Oracle, including any patches you want to apply, and then uh, creates a Docker file and executes it. And that Docker file is created in a way that, to be honest, we were never able to do. So it's, it's actually the following best practices for Docker. 
The other tools that are very uh, important uh, for us are uh, for the logging uh, or just, uh, like managing the logging is uh, Elasticsearch, uh, FluentD or FluentBit. Uh, we're currently looking at uh, using FluentBit instead of FluentD because of its, uh, it's a lower uh, footprint. Uh, and of course, Kibana uh, for the, the logging. And then we have the question of uh, monitoring and showing uh, the health of a system, which is uh, for which we use uh, Prometheus as and Grafana as the uh, tool to um, visualize everything. So that's um, actually used at the moment. Uh, we're still learning a lot as we uh, move on, but the nice thing is it most of these things uh, almost work out of the box. So that's, that's, and there is a lot of documentation available. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very brief on uh, what we want to do as next steps. It's just some topics that I wanted to mention is, the first one is, is microservices. And, that, and there it was the long a, a question on should we go for microservices or not? Being an enterprise application, it's, it's, a, it's a big application, has a lot of features and functionalities. So it's not easy uh, and certainly, in my opinion, time consuming to uh, transform the complete application to microservices. However, when we were on our, uh, uh, on our journey, uh, we did find out that we don't have to actually uh, transform the complete application to uh, microservices, we can already start by using parts of it to microservices. One of them uh, that we're uh, actually at the moment uh, developing is, as I mentioned, uh, we are using a BI publisher to generate uh, documents, is they're uh, using the libraries, which are actually Java libraries in, uh, for the BI publisher, and put those uh, or make those available as a microservice. So for that, um, we are using Helidon uh, as, a, as a tool to help us uh, make that transition to uh, microservices. Uh, and also uh, Graal VM to keep the image as small as possible. Now, the, by having that experience, there came apparent that there were already another a few other candidates to uh, start uh, transforming to microservices. Uh, one of them is uh, we have a workflow management system and one of the things that the system needs to do uh, quite often and which takes some uh, resources is calculating priorities of tasks. We find that was also a very good case where we saw that, okay, we can take that out of the application and use it as a microservice. Uh, same as uh, generating or creating uh, EDI, uh, so XML messages or JSON messages. And by that, I think I came to the end of my story. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. So just to follow on from that and, and to wrap up, um, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's clear that um, from Tony's experience that, yeah, great, we've got a, um, a, a Kubernetes operator that, that helps to, um, to migrate the uh, that application, but uh, as you can, as you saw from Tony, app, uh, enterprise applications have a lot of complex interdependencies. That they need monitoring. They need access control, um, and you want to run these applications in in a in the same kind of environment that uh, you would want to start uh, developing microservices, as Tony uh, mentioned. So to that, that end. Um, what we're doing is to um, is to build out um, the environment that almost the same as what uh, Tony talked about. So we're building um, some workload management um, tooling, which again is open source, um, called Verizano, that makes use of underlying infrastructure management, um, like Rancher and Istio, to to deploy the um, the underlying Kubernetes environment, and we're pre 
wiring and joining together um, the monitoring um, with tooling uh, for CICD uh, and integrated security um, using these products. And it's it's a an opinionated but um, very much open source based environment to help the deployment of these enterprise applications as they are onto Kubernetes running um, on-premise, um, public cloud, and, and of course, um, multi-cloud. Multi so we're um, building this up um, to, to build this kind of picture, which is while the operator in Kubernetes is great to be, um, to be successful, you have to have a, a complete in, in environment with which to support those, those applications. And it also gives, as Tony mentioned, the, the environment to be able to lift and shift um, these traditional enterprise applications to the, to the cloud. That means you don't have to, from day one, re-architect, and it gives the environment with Heladon and Istio and uh, those other um, environments to be able to start to um, develop these new um, and develop the new services, microservices around that, um, on that environment. So that's just a, a, a kind of, but it's a bit of roadmap, but we're actively um, working on that um, at the moment. And we're sort of um, in doing the initial testing with that. So hopefully that's um, given you uh, an idea of the sorts of issues when, you've got to think about when migrating these applications and also to give you some confidence that um, there are tools and environments to help and that people like interests are being successful and, and doing that, that journey. So um, with that, I would like to thank everybody for their time. I um, hope it was um, interesting and worthwhile. And uh, I think if there's any questions, we've got a couple of minutes left for that. Uh, thanks, Paul and Tony, for a great presentation. Uh, we do have some time for some questions, and I know there are a couple queued up that I'll get to. If you have a question that you would like to ask, uh, please drop it into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we have time for. Um, so first question, um, which type of WebLogic domain configuration do you run in prod? Uh, domain image in home or domain home on PV? Uh, could you please give the reason for choosing the option? Okay, I guess that's uh, a question addressed to me. Uh, we've chosen for the domain image in uh, in home, so not on the persistent volume. Uh, and the reason for that is that it, it's much easier uh, if you want to connect it to your CI/CD. So uh, uh, if uh, the moment we got a new uh, Docker image with the WebLogic domain, it's uh, it's it's just easier to manage. Awesome. Um, next question: Can we run legacy or monolithic applications written in Java eight using the WebLogic operator on Kubernetes? Uh, not sure whether that's a question for me or for Paul. Uh, Java uh, Java eight. Yep, Java eight. Um, I I believe so, but that's something I'd have I'd have to um, double check. Um, for my two cents, I believe you can run Java eight applications. However, the one thing to keep in mind is anything before I think Java ten. Um, Java doesn't necessarily adhere to C groups, and it can consume more memory mm -hmm. than you allot it. So, thanks, Jeff. A bit. Yep. <laughs> Uh, next question, what are you using to manage Rancher? Uh, I mean, infra, infra as code to deploy Kubernetes via Rancher and managing Helm charts if using that? Uh, basically, yes, to, to, to that. Um, it's, it's, early, it's early days um, in, in, the, in that. Um, so we've, we've basically got um, yeah, Rancher, managing the, the the infrastructure underneath and um, the the sort of Verizano is the layer on top of that to to manage the um, the application environment running on top of that 
Awesome. Uh, how are you managing storage on bare metal via Kubernetes? Uh, it's not the same for Oracle for sure. Um, I'm not sure that um, I understand the question. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. No. So, uh, what I think what we're doing is we're using um, the uh, file system of uh, of the Oracle Cloud, uh, but that's not for the uh, uh, the application and say it's more uh, an easier means to uh, store the uh, the loggings of all the different systems and that they are easier, uh, better accessible by tools. Uh, such as uh, Prometheus. Uh, and just know. just to add to that, they mentioned uh, that they meant EdgeFS uh, or Ceph. Uh, if oh, right. Are, yeah. If there are any other questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A tab. We do have a couple more minutes, so we can take a few questions. Uh, next question is, in your microservices, have you considered stateless applications? Uh, the things we do as uh, use as a microservice are in fact stateless. I mean, they, um, we're looking at uh, because in the for the instance for the BI publisher, which we use for the documents, is um, we both uh, uh, provide the data as an XML and uh, the templates. So we actually don't need any access uh, to the database. So it's in my opinion it's stateless. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think that's kind of um, a good recommendation um, or an approach is that if microservices um, being predominantly stateless, um, I know you don't have to be, but um, I think that's one of the areas that, you know, these applications that Tony was talking about rely quite heavily on state and state management. So they're not all necessarily a great thing just to be able to break down and say, right, we're just going to use a, a service mesh and we completely replace that because that's, that's quite an undertaking. All right. Uh, one last question. How are you managing your state full pr uh, footprint? So I would say, so I would say um, the, the, the state, for, the state um, for the applications is is managed by or stored in the the database. I that's think that's correct. what that. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So we don't we don't put anything. Um, everything that has state is actually uh, written to the database, including, uh, for instance, for the message broker, uh, the persistent stores are are actually stored also in the database. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Paul and Tony, for a great presentation and Q&A session. Uh, that is all the questions we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.